Mr. Fish, I'm going to ask you next about the um, process in terms of uh, applications for stage two payments. Could we look at CVHB 609 underscore 118, please? So you'll see from um, this, Mr. Fish, this is a um, guidance notes for those making an application. If we look uh, about a third of the way down the page at the question, how do I know if I qualify for the additional payment? It says this, in order to qualify, you must first have received the basic £20,000 payment from the Skipton Fund. Provided this is the case, you should then automatically qualify for the additional payment if, and then there are three categories of case, liver transplant, waiting list for a liver transplant, liver cancer. And then it says this, alternatively, if you and your specialist doctor suspect or have confirmation that you have an advanced stage of liver damage called cirrhosis, you may also qualify. Um, what was your understanding of um, what was required in terms of, of, of cirrhosis in order to qualify? So evidence in whatever form that may be that cirrhosis was probable. Um, so various blood tests and later fibro scans, um, just anything that the clinician could provide to assess whether or not cirrhosis was probable rather than fibrosis. Um, can you assist us why it, this, these guide notes say that the individual may also qualify rather than saying you will qualify if you have an advanced stage of liver um, cirrhosis? Because um, I didn't word that originally. It was my understanding that if they had cirrhosis, they would definitely qualify. Okay. So um, there wasn't an extra area of discretion? Maybe, maybe it's just yeah, maybe it's just because it's not quite as a clear-cut diagnosis as the other. Obviously, if you either have had or haven't had a liver transplant, uh, you either are or are not on the waiting list, and the same with cancer. You either have or haven't been diagnosed with it. Whereas with cirrhosis, because um, it's a degree of fibrosis leading up to cirrhosis, I think that's probably why it was worded that way. So is this right? Your approach was, provided that you were satisfied um, that the uh, um, uh, applicant uh, uh, um, on the balance of probabilities had cirrhosis, they would, assuming they'd qualified at the stage one um, basic payment stage, um, they would then qualify for the additional payment. Yeah, definitely. And if we look at the bottom of the page, we can see it says, um, uh, uh, how do I get the evidence? A specialist doctor must provide evidence of the extent of your liver disease if you are to qualify for the additional payment. The specialist will be asked to complete the application form on your behalf by providing evidence based on tests or your medical history. And then if we go over the page, I don't think I need to go through the detail of it, but under the heading application form, it explains how that's going to be completed by the doctor. Um, before I, I ask you about one particular part of this, this, these notes, um, uh, were applications for stage two payments largely decided on the basis of the clinician's opinions as set out in the application form? Yeah, we did rely on their opinion a lot. Um, and then if we look at the heading, the tests, we'll go a little further down the page. Um, it says, if your specialist is satisfied that the test results you've had in the past will be sufficient to complete the application form, you will not need to have any tests. If you've had a liver biopsy in the past that confirms you have cirrhosis, that will be sufficient. The Skipton Fund doesn't require that you have one. Um, and then there's further reference to potential risks involved in liver biopsies. Next paragraph says, if information from a liver biopsy is not available, the results of certain blood tests may be sufficient. This, I think, is a pre-fibro scans being um, um, routine. Uh, and yeah. then um, it, it suggested that we will need the results from more than one set of tests. Um, I'll come on to fibro scans in a moment, but... In terms of blood tests, what would satisfy the Skipton Fund in terms of proof of, prob of probable cirrhosis? 
Uh, it's been a number of years since I was dealing with these applications, but there were certain enzymes that would be raised or more likely to be raised if you had sclerosis and others that would likely to be low um, amongst other things. So it was all to do with the liver function tests and particular markers within those. Um, and there was another in section two or three of the application form. There was a formula that could be worked out using the blood tests. Um, and if it was above a certain number based on these markers, then we would accept that as evidence. You probably got a copy the application form, so you'll be able to see what I mean. Prior to you having either Professor Thomas or, or, or Professor DeShaco, to whom you could turn up from 2013 onwards, um, was there anyone else uh, with any specialist knowledge of, of, of hepatology to whom you were able to turn in order to seek advice in assessing stage two applications? So similar to stage one, it would have been via Elizabeth Boyd and the Royal Free and liver specialists there. Um, but before the widespread availability of FibroScan results, how common was it that stage one registrants couldn't demonstrate the criteria for stage two because without a biopsy, the extent of their liver damage couldn't be determined? Without access to the statistics, I'm, I'm not sure. We certainly had some deferrals, but I wouldn't be able to say how frequently. They were deferred as opposed to approved. As and when FibroScan technology became more widespread, um, was there any proactive effort on the part of the fund to get back in contact with um, applicants whose stage two uh, applications had not been allowed um, in order to encourage them to make a further application? Uh, because they were only ever deferred, and um, we said in the letter that if anything changes, if you have further tests, you're welcome to reapply. Um, and if they if they were deferred, presumably they would have been at an advanced stage of fibrosis, so they would have been in hopefully regular contact with their specialists. So if a fibro scan was done as part of their treatment that showed progression to cirrhosis, they would have reapplied. So is is this right? And I, I don't mean this is a pejorative question, um, um, Mr Fish, but the Skipton Fund itself didn't take proactive steps to get back in contact with individuals and say, now might be the time to, to, to reactivate your stage two application because we know fibre scans are being used. Um, you, you made an assumption mm -hmm. that they'd be under the care of a specialist who would be able to um, undertake those tests for them. I mean, it didn't mean that they had access to FibroScan. Obviously, it started in some hospitals and then it became more widespread. So we might have been telling people that you can now get a FibroScan, um, whereas the reality is that they couldn't. Um, if we could then look at SKIP 5076 013, please. We can see bottom of the page is an email dated the 29th of February 2008 from you to Dr. Mutima. Um, uh, you say, we're seeing an increasing number of second stage applications where the test results on which the degree of liver damage is being based from a fibro scan. As I understand it, this is a fairly new test and is not available at every hospital. In your opinion, what is the minimum fibro scan result which indicates that cirrhosis is present? Do you have any other information about fibro scans which you think may be useful? And then if we can go to, to the top of the page and see Dr. Mutima's response. Uh, he says, wish there was an easy answer. Fibroscan is being used in a few places around the UK. There's no real way to assess the quality of results. And then um, he says the results are fairly reproducible. It seems valid that people are using it to assess the amount of fibrosis in the liver. It's hard to define an acceptable cutoff to identify which patient has cirrhosis. As the value increases, so does the likelihood of cirrhosis. Uh, and then he gives some specific data. And then in the last sentence says, if we are to use fibroscan scan results, then the Skipton Fund would need to decide what likelihood ratio or positive predictive value would be sufficient to justify second payment. Um, did the Skipton Fund subsequently decide what likelihood ratio or positive predictive value would be sufficient? Yeah, so we actually had a lower score of 12.5. I'm not sure now exactly how we got that, whether that was from 
different advice from a different doctor. Um, but that wasn't a hard and fast 12.5 and above is yes, 12.5 and below is no. Uh, um, but that was a sort of marker we used and then we looked at everything else that was submitted in connection with the application in conjunction with that fiber scan score. Um, so it wasn't a hard and fast cutoff that we used, but over 12.5 is sort of in the realms where crisis was probable. So to remember that was the number we used. Um, if we then go back to your witness statement, please. WITN 4466002. And if we could go to page 16, please, show me. Picking it up at the bottom of the page in paragraph 31.4. You refer to um, a, um, a model being uh, identified to ascertain likely dates of progression of disease. Uh, and if we go to the next page, we pick it up about halfway down that long paragraph. It says, with the help of Professor Thomas, the fund created a model using evidence from a medical study that estimated the speed of fibrotic progression in people with hepatitis C and the speed of progression in people co-infected with HIV and hepatitis C. Um, were the results of that fibrotic progression study used solely to consider uh, applications that uh, related to haemophiliacs with hepatitis C, or, or were they used to consider applications of non-haemophiliacs as well? Um, yeah, so in this case, it was primarily people with haemophilia um, because even though they passed away many years ago and there were no records available, we would have known from databases that they had haemophilia and received treatment over particular years, whereas with one-off blood transfusions, we wouldn't have had that information. So, yeah, this was predominantly people who had haemophilia or bleeding disorder who passed away. If we can next look at an exchange of correspondence you had with Dr Macris... SKIP 5031 underscore 103, please show me. This is a letter to you from Professor Macris, um, uh, November 2013. Um, uh, and he says, uh, I'm writing to you for clarification about a policy decision. He refers to having recently submitted a form on behalf of one of our patients with a very high fibroscan score, and that being returned to him, asking for information about other causes for high fibroscan measurements. Um, and then if, uh, if we go to the next paragraph, in the past you've accepted that if the patient has hepatitis C and cirrhosis, they were eligible for payment irrespective of their alcohol intake. Can you clarify whether the rules have changed? As far as I know, I've never provided information about alcohol intake. This has never been questioned previously. Uh, and then he poses the question uh, um, in the next paragraph. I wonder how the question about whether the patient had diabetes was relevant. If the patient has chronic hepatitis C and was diabetic, would that have precluded them from payment? And then before I ask you about this, if we just look at your reply... SKIP 5031 underscore 101. So you responded, and this says 6th of December 2012, but I suspect that might be a, um, a de um, uh, an error and it should have been 2013, um, because if we look just up the page... There's a handwritten note emailed to Howard, 5th of December 2013, and it seems to be responding to Professor Macris's letter. In any event, you say in the second paragraph, the reason we ask such questions is not to ascertain whether outside influences have caused cirrhosis, um, as the scheme does not distinguish between cirrhosis caused by hepatitis C or, for instance, alcohol abuse. Rather, they are to ascertain whether or not the fibroscan result was increased by other factors rather than cirrhosis. And then you go on in the next paragraph to refer, I think, to a, a request that Professor Thomas had asked you to raise this issue uh, because um, um, someone with fibrosis or fat deposits in the liver might have a fibroscan reading 
within the cirrhotic range, and there's the reference to 12.5, even though they do not have cirrhosis. Um, now, some core participants have, have uh, um, asked um, me to ask about this in particular because you'll appreciate there's a concern that um, the Skipton Fund may have been looking for other potential causes of liver damage, such as alcohol intake or obesity, as a basis for rejecting application. Are you able to comment on that and explain what, why this information was being sought? Yeah, so it was nothing to do with the cause of cirrhosis. So if somebody had have developed cirrhosis, having already received stage one uh, due to alcohol intake, they could have still and um, would have been approved if there was evidence of cirrhosis. So the issue with alcohol intake was if, there were, if the blood tests weren't suggestive of cirrhosis and the only piece of evidence we had was a raised fibro scan, um, the reason to ask about alcohol was because that could cause inflammation in the liver, which causes an increased um, fibro scan score. So it was basically to weigh up what was causing the increase in the fibro scan score, where the blood tests weren't indicative of cirrhosis. Um, uh, and then uh, if we could look at one further letter on a, a similar topic, but a year later from the Haemophilia Society, SKIP 5031 underscore 100. So th this is a letter from Ms. Carol, the Chief Executive of the Haemophilia Society, to you. Um, she, she's expressing a concern um, in the first paragraph about there being a significant difference in the number of people um, differed or rejected from the bleeding disorder community. And then she says in the second paragraph um, this, you say, for example, that someone with a high BMI or alcohol intake can have their application deferred if their platelets and other tests are normal, even if their fibre scan score is higher than normal. However, within our community, if someone has received contaminated blood, has haemophilia and lives their life in fairly constant pain and with a major disability due to joint damage from their haemophilia, it wouldn't be unusual for them to have a high BMI and possibly due to the pain isolation and the fact that they've lost large numbers of friends to contaminated blood. They may also drink larger amounts of alcohol than those without a bleeding disorder. How is this taken into account and weighed in your decision-making process? This should not exclude them from receiving payment. If there's any possibility they have cirrhosis, we believe they should be accepted for stage two payment using the balance of probability rather than the beyond doubt principle. Um, do, do you, um, or c can you recall, first of all, how this issue arose that was being raised by the Haemophilia Society? So it looks as if it was to do with fibro scan and us asking about if there's anything else affecting the fibro scan score. Um, but like I say, if somebody drunk excess amounts of alcohol and had a high BMI, um, but there was evidence of cirrhosis, we would have approved the application. They weren't excluded for having a high BMI and drinking alcohol, certainly not. Um, so we, we weighed up all of the information we had available to, and um, as you said, use the balance of probabilities, that's what we did. If we then just move into a different topic, um, but still on stage two application. Sorry, can yes. I just mention on the next paragraph yeah. about the statistics where she says every one of the contaminated blood population will have had their infection for 30 years. Um, obviously, the stats would have been skewed by people who cleared the virus with interferon. Um, so, yeah, if what you're saying, if the person hadn't cleared with interferon, then that might have been the progression rate, but this statistic or um, X percent who cleared with interferon treatment. Sorry, I just want, I think we might have missed a few words then, and I just want to check I've understood what you were saying. If we look at the um, the next um, paragraph, she's expressing concern that only 18% of applicants, presumably from the bleeding disorder community, are accepted as having cirrhosis, um, which would suggest 82% reject it. Um, it, it. Are you able to assist with understanding that figure? Yes, I think 18% would be accepted, but that doesn't take into account those that hadn't applied because they cleared hepatitis C and their liver damage wasn't progressing at the same rate as she indicates above. 
Um, so it, it assumes that everyone still has chronic hepatitis C. And it doesn't take into account clearers either. Um, can we then um, look at SKIP 5030 underscore 013? Um, these are the minutes of a meeting of the Skipton Board of Directors, 17th of February 2011, at which you're present. And if we look at the bottom half of the page, last paragraph, it says, The Board agreed that the scheme administrator and the chairman should raise the issue of borderline stage two applications at their meeting with the Department of Health on Friday the 18th of February. Um, and then there's reference to the uh, anticipated increase in stage two payment to £50,000 and the regular annual payment um, and the suggestion that's going to result in a surge of applications, many of which would be borderline. And, and then a reference to referring to FibroScan on the application form. Um, what, what was it you were proposing to raise with the Department of Health? Can you recall? What, why were they being asked about borderline applications at all? Yeah, it sounds as if once it would normally have been deferred due to the blood test results uh, before FibroScan was available. We were then getting ones where the blood test results would have suggested referral, but the FibroScan results were suggesting possible cirrhosis. So if FibroScan hadn't have existed, they would have been deferred based on the blood test results and the other tests available on the form. So I think it was to raise that issue. And do you recall um, um, now how the Department of Health responded? We certainly added FibroScan onto the form, um, so I think they accepted that we should be taking everything available to us into account. Uh, and then if we could look at SKIP 5030 underscore 085, please. These are the minutes of a meeting of the Skipton Fund Directors, 11th of March 2013, um, with you in attendance. If we go to the second page, please. Um, we can see at the bottom of the page, the, the issue uh, uh, there is stage two applications from the estates of people who were co-infected who died before the 29th of August 2003 and whose records have been destroyed. Um, and then if we go to the next page... There's reference to a, a um, discussion from the panel, I think that's the appeal panel, and a suggestion um, um, by Dr. Mutima. And then the next paragraph refers to the, the model of fibrotic progression uh, created by Professor Thomas, which I asked you about a few moments ago. Um, and then it says this, um, the scheme administrator summarized the model, the values and dates that have been used, and the reasons why these figures have been used. Around 40 declined applications from the estates of co-infected people would need reviewing on the basis of this model. The scheme administrator confirmed that the department who were satisfied with the model had asked that the review be deferred until the start of the upcoming financial year. Um, do, do you know why the department was requesting um, that you defer reviewing um, the, the 40 or so declined applications? Must have been to do with their budgets. I hadn't remembered that, but yeah, it must have been to do with their budget. And, and that could potentially lead to a delay in individuals or, or their their um, uh, families receiving the payment if if the uh, application upon review was successful. Do, do you recall you or, or or the chair and anyone else or anyone else expressing concern that people's um, payments should not be delayed? Sure, we did. Um, I can't remember those meetings, though. No. Sorry, what was the date of this? The, of these the date minutes? of this is the 11th of March 2013. Okay, so it was only, I mean, it's not maybe not acceptable. It's only three weeks till the next financial year. But that's still three weeks, isn't it? So, but yeah, I'm sure we, we would have mentioned it. Um, do you know whether... Um, once the new financial year started, whether that review was undertaken swiftly? Yeah, it's quite possible we started the review straight away and didn't communicate responses until 1st of April. Um, but yeah, we wouldn't have used that to stop us from re reviewing 
the applications. Um, do you recall the Department of Health ever expressing a concern that increasing the payment to £50,000 might encourage people not to accept treatment because there would be a substantial financial incentive to allow their condition to worsen? That's probably something they considered internally, but it's not something that we weren't part of. Um, prior to the widespread availability of fibre scans, are you confident that it was never necessary for an applicant to provide biopsy evidence in order to succeed in a stage two application? Yeah, we definitely never asked someone to have a biopsy. Um, if we can then go back to your witness statement, please. So WITN 4466002. And if we can go to page 18. If we look at paragraph 33.2 towards the bottom of the page. Um, th 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 this is about bereavement payments, Mr Fish. So you talk about how... Um, a few years later, the DHSC introduced regular payments at a lesser level than the Stage 2 regular payments for living applicants who've qualified for a Stage 1 payment, and a bereavement payment of £10,000 uh, for the partners of deceased applicants where hepatitis C had been a contributing cause of death. Um, was the question of, of whether hepatitis C had been a contributing cause of death a balance of probabilities test, as far as you can recall? Yeah, essentially. Um, and I think with the help of the Department of Health, um, they came up with quite good guidance about what we needed to look out for on the death certificate, um, which would enable us to make the payment. Um, and then if we came across a death certificate that had a term that hadn't been mentioned that we weren't sure of, um, we would run that by the Department of Health for clarification. Um, if you didn't have evidence on a death certificate, um, um, what other evidence, if any, was capable of satisfying you that the bereavement payment should be made? I think medical records. You could have accepted medical records that were suggestive of a contributing cause of death. And can you recall whether you looked for an actual reference to hepatitis C on the death certificate or, or liver cancer or liver disease? All of those, plus many others, um, but I can't recall the specific list, it's quite long. There are lots of things I hadn't heard of before. Um, we can take that down, thank you, Shemek. But Yes, yeah, certainly all the terms you just mentioned would be evidence. Um, in terms of the regular uh, payments that, that commenced, um, was any choice given to uh, uh, applicants about how frequently they could receive their payments? Monthly, quarterly, yeah, quarterly annually? Yeah, quarterly or monthly, we gave that option. Um, and was it um, ever part of the services or facilities offered by the Skipton Fund to make available financial advice for applicants on how to use their money? Not by the Skipton Fund. I think it's something that Caxton offered. Caxton Foundation. We then look, please, at DHSC three. Uh, sorry, yeah, DHSC three zeros four zero six three underscore zero zero two. Um, please show me. Um, and if we could go to. Um, the second page, we can see this is an email from an individual to Elsa White at the Department of Health, 17th of April 2013, uh, refers to having been infected with hepatitis C and having cirrhosis of the liver and having had a liver transplant, refers to receiving uh, um, stage one, stage two payments. Then if we go to the next page, Um, uh, 
the applicant says this. Um, I, last Friday, I received a phone call from the Skipton Fund to let me know I was entitled to a further lump sum payment of £25,000. I later discovered through the SF website I was also entitled to a flat rate regular payment of £14,000 per annum and that these payments have been available since 2011. I, spoke, I, I phoned the Skipton Fund to confirm the availability of this regular payment and to inquire about backdating to 2011. I spoke to Nick Fish, scheme administrator, who told me that he was unable to backdate the payment and that I would need to apply to the Department of Health for any backdating. Um, uh, and um, the, the next paragraph also says that you told this individual you couldn't backdate the payment as over two years had elapsed since the original announcement. Um, so um, that's what your record is saying. If we then go to the first page of this document, I just want to show you the reply before asking you about it. It's the bottom of the page. So the response from Elsa White um, uh, uh, um, starts here. And if we go to the top of the next page, she says this, with regard to your request for backdating, this is not automatic, but the Skipton Fund is responsible for assessing such requests as they arise and making a decision about whether to backdate. We've spoken with the fund and I'll let you know of their decision shortly. So this appears to suggest that you're saying it was for the Department of Health to make decisions on backdating. The Department of Health is saying it's for the Skipton Fund to make decisions on backdating. What was the policy and practice in relation to backdating? So, yeah, it definitely was their decision at first. And I think I was quite surprised by this letter. But following receipt of this letter, we happily backdated everyone who which we felt was fair in any case. Um, we backdated everyone who was due backdated payment. So does, does it follow that prior to this individual raising the issue with Dr um, White, with Elsa White at the Department of Health in April 2013, um, you, as in the Skipton Fund, um, w wouldn't have been um, backdating any payments because you um, understood that to be something as it were, in the gift of the department, rather than for, for you to be able to do? No, I think that two years might have been significant. So we certainly were backdating um, when the changes to the scheme were made, because it obviously took us a while to find some of the people. There must have been some sort of cut-off date where we were told we could no longer backdate. Um, and then following this letter, we did backdate everyone again. So as far as I'm aware, there was no one that we ever didn't backdate. And if it was our choice, we'd obviously happily backdate, and that's the right thing to do. So. Um, I want to ask you now about a separate and discrete topic. Um, if we go to WITN 4466004, please. Um, this is um, a, a joint letter from you and from Dave White, head of the Department for Work and Pensions Fraud Investigation Service. It's not dated, but it refers to a meeting that you'd had in August 2011, so it's presumably produced at some point after that. And the second paragraph says, the Skipton Fund wanted to establish whether beneficiaries of the fund could be excluded from such fraud investigations, uh, so DWP fraud investigations, as a result of their apparent non-declaration of income or capital. You'll be aware that capital and income paid through the fund does not impact on means-tested benefits paid through DWP. It was recognised that in the majority of cases, investigations start because of data matching carried out between government departments, and there is no way that matches relating to beneficiaries can be separated out. We agreed that between our organisations, we will do all we can to minimise the risk of beneficiaries being called to a fraud investigation interval, interview. Internal processes are being created to make this happen. If you are called to such an interview, please feel free to quote or show this letter. The investigator will then know what action to take. Um, what, what can you recall about the, the background or, or, or events that led to you um, having this meeting with the Department for Work and Pensions? Yes, we were hearing of people who are being interviewed under caution and being investigated for fraud. Uh, because they'd received payments from the Skipton Fund, which should have been disregarded um, when they were assessed for means-tested benefits. Obviously, this is unacceptable, so even though we didn't have much in our power we could do to prevent the DWP from investigating uh, these cases, obviously we wanted it to stop. Um, 
So we raised the issue with the DWP um, and essentially said, is, what can you do to stop this from happening? Because uh, obviously it's not right that people are put through that. Um, and it seems to have been the DWP's position um, that in terms of what was referred to as data matching, there was no way that matches relating to beneficiaries can be separated out. C can you assist us with what that refers to, data matching carried out between government departments? So I think, although I don't work and never have worked for the DWP, I think they had ways of seeing income or at least interest on income that people were receiving. Um, and if that didn't match up with the answers though that they were providing about savings, I think that would flag that potentially there's undeclared savings that the person has. So I think it's all regarding that. I don't know how it all worked in practice. Um, um, is, is it right to understand that the, one of the purposes in sending this letter was that it would then enable the, the recipients of the letter, if they were um, it called for interview by the DWP, to show this letter and explain that they shouldn't be interviewed? Yeah, definitely. And d can, can you recall to what extent this problem continued over the following years? I can't. I'm, I'm not sure, unfortunately. So we didn't always hear about if somebody was called to interview in the first place. Um, so, yeah, we wouldn't have known. But I'd like to think it did help. Um, there's a rather earlier letter I just wanted to but ask you about. Just, on just, just before you, you do that, uh, if you just look at the top paragraph in the screen, uh, the third or fourth letter from uh, a sentence from last begins, we agreed that, that's, those are the three words at the end of the, the line, we agreed that between our organisations we'll do what we, all we can, all we can, to minimise the risk of beneficiaries being called to a fraud investigation interview. Then, then this is said, internal processes are being created to make this happen. But what can you tell us about any internal processes so far as Skipton uh, was concerned? I can't recall, I'm afraid. So th this presumably then just refers to DWP, does it? Yeah, it's certainly down to them to stop investigating people. There's not much we could have done to influence Thank you. them other than highlight this issue and expect them to do all they could to stop it from happening. I, th I wrote to every DWP centre um, explaining the schemes um, so if they saw payments from any of the named trusts that they should not take that money into account yep, thank you very when they investigate it. And I think it's right if we go to the top of the next page in terms, in terms of action by the Skipton Fund I think the, all, 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 that, all that's set out um, is is here, um, in the event you're asked to attend an interview in connection with your payments, you should first contact the Skipton Fund before doing anything. Do not intend, attend the interview until you've obtained our advice. Um, what, what was going to be the purpose of, of, of someone contacting the Skipton Fund? Um, and, and what kind of advice would you expect to give if they had done so? I think it was to reassure them that no payments that they'd received from the Skipton Fund or any of the other trusts should be taken into account um, for their savings. So it's just to make it clear that none of that money they should be taken into account. Um, I can't remember if there was other advice we gave at the time. Do you recall ever being contacted by an individual and then um, um, yourself contacting the DWP, as it were, on behalf of that individual uh, to suggest that they should cease their investigation? I believe I had, yeah, I may well have written letters of support. I can't recall how often or any specific examples, but certainly something I was willing to do if it would have helped. And yeah, I'm fairly sure I did on occasion. That was 2011. I just want to ask you about an earlier letter on, on the subject of benefits. It's at HSOC 007883. Um, th this is a letter to an individual, 2nd of February 2007. You say, in response to your request, please accept this letter as confirmation that any benefits that recipients of Skipton Fund payments are receiving will not be affected by their payment from the Skipton Fund. 
the benefit waiver number that should be quoted to benefits agencies in order to allow the payment to be disregarded is 2004-1141. Um, and then you say, I hope this letter answers your question. So it sounds as though you've been contacted by uh, an individual recipient of, of Skipton Fund payments asking for assistance, and, and, and this was your response. Um, what, what was the significance of the benefit waiver number? Can you recall? Yeah, I think that's in reference to a piece of legislation where it sets out that the monies from the Skipton Fund should be disregarded. Um, so, yeah, some, some piece of government legislation where that number is attached to it. Um, we can take that down, thank you. Um, now, you've m made clear in, in your statement that in terms of the appeal process, that could not be used to challenge the parameters of the scheme itself. And you've said in your statement of applicants were dissatisfied with the eligibility rules themselves. You provided the contact details of the Department of Health so they could make a complaint to the Department of Health. Um, were you ever made aware of any such complaints being made to the Department about eligibility rules and, and how the Department responded? We certainly handed out their contact details on a few occasions, so I, I wouldn't know the ins and outs of what complaint was raised or what was written in the correspondence, but yeah, we definitely gave out their contact details on a number of occasions for people to use. I'm going to move on from the Skipton Fund now and ask you just a handful of questions about the McFarlane Trust and the Caxton Foundation. Um, starting um, with the McFarlane Trust as being the, the first in time that you would have worked for, um, what were your roles and responsibilities at the McFarlane Trust? So, initially, whilst as a temp, it was to as assist the finance department with various things. Um, one thing I can remember, they wanted to see if the level of mileage that trustees claimed was in line with other charities, things like that. Um, and then later, I became the assistant to the chief executive. Um, and as part of that role, it was minute taking. Um, if there was a policy that the trustees were considering, um, I would analyse how much it would cost um, using spreadsheets. So I'd design the spreadsheets based on the number of beneficiaries you had. Um, and then, yeah, they could see how much the policies they were discussing would cost and how much that would overall budget that they had for disbursements. Did, did you have any role in developing the actual substantive content of policies at the McFarlane Trust? None at all, no. D did you have any role um, in the taking of decisions about either regular payment or uh, single grants? No, not involved at all. To, to what extent, if at all, did you have any direct interactions with beneficiaries of the McFarlane Trust? Um, so I attend the events. There are a couple of events each year. Um, one that was for male uh, people with bleeding disorders. Um, everyone was invited to attend, and it was a chance for them to meet up with everyone. Um, and they had certain workshops they had throughout the day, and then socialised in the evenings. So I attended that on an annual basis. And then I think there was another larger event that was for, for everyone, um, any beneficiary of the trust that could attend. So once, I think. Um, and then there were other ones for women with bleeding disorders, which obviously I wasn't invited to. Um, you, you worked um, um, for most, uh, or for the first few years that you were involved in, under Martin Harvey. Um, did, did, do you recall him ever expressing any views to you about beneficiaries in general or, or using any derogatory language to describe them? No. Um, what was the relationship like between um, the Board of Trustees and the Chief Executive, either Mr Harvey or then Ms Barlow, during the time you were involved with the McFarlane Trust? Well, I seem fine. I don't recall any major issues or any issues. D did your role change at all um, um, when Ms Barlow took over um, in uh, early 2013? Yeah, so my involvement, I stopped attending meetings. I, I did little, very little work for either of the Caxton Foundation or McFarland Trust after that time. And why was that? I think she hired her own assistant, so 
there was essentially no need for my small role within the charities. Um, and and um, do, do you have any observations to make either about the, the um, as a long-standing employee of both uh, Skipton and um, and McFarland Trust, and perhaps for a shorter period of time, Caxton? Any observations about the management style of, of, of either Mr. Harvey or Ms. Barlow? Do you mean towards employees or? Yes. No, it was always a fairly, fairly good working relationship. Nothing unusual. Um, d did you pick up anything about the relationship between um, um, the chief executive, either Mr Harvey or then Ms Barlow, and the beneficiary community during your employment there? I think because Martin was involved for so many years, um, he knew many of them. I wouldn't say personally, but he, he certainly had grown to know them over the years, so he had... Like I say, not a personal relationship, but he, he seemed to have a rapport with some of the beneficiaries. Whereas Jan coming in, I'm not sure she had enough time to, to develop that. That's probably the biggest difference. Um, just one document I want to ask you about, and in relation to the McFarlane Trust, it's at AHOH 5064. Um, it's a document entitled Possible Reasons Why the Board May Not Wish for Russell Mishcon's Dissertation to be Published. Um, the inquiry's current understanding is that this is a document that you produced. Is that correct? I think so. You don't think so? No. Okay, so you've no, you've no recollection of being asked to go through Mr Mishcon's dissertation and, uh, and identify reasons why it shouldn't be published? No, okay. don't think so. In that case, um, I don't think I can sensibly ask you. Sorry, I, I read this when you made it available, and yeah, it didn't sound like it was something I would have written, to be honest. I can't say 100% that I didn't, but it really didn't look like something I'd done. Uh, do, you, do you recall being present at any meetings um, at which the question of Mr Mishcon's dissertation being published was, and its contents were discussed? Only that he was unhappy that it wasn't able to be published, but... I wasn't obviously party to the decision that it shouldn't be. Um, mo moving then to the Caxton Foundation, um, uh, again, what, what were your roles and responsibilities in relation to the Caxton Foundation? So in the very early days, I attended the board meetings. I think I might have taken the minutes for those meetings. Um, and again, analysing policy, um, potential policies, so costing them out, essentially. Um, and, and do we understand that the, your involvement with the Caxton Foundation um, uh, reduced to little or, or, or nothing after Ms Barlow took over in early 2013? Yeah, that's right. D did you have any direct interaction with beneficiaries of the Caxton Foundation? Um, whilst Martin was still the chief exec, I attended a couple of, I'm not sure if they were called partnership group meetings, but... We certainly had five or six Caxton Foundation beneficiaries present um, in the very early days where we would discuss how things were working. But it, that, that, that's it, is it, in terms of interactions with Caxton beneficiaries? Yeah. Although, obviously, every Caxton beneficiary was also a Skipton Fund applicant, so I knew, I knew many of them through that. Um, it, can we go to uh, H... PCT four zeros two one zero underscore zero one five. This is a meeting on new contaminated blood payments and new hepatitis C charity, eighteenth of February. It seemed likely that's probably the eighteenth of February two thousand and eleven. And it's a meeting with various Department of Health representatives and then various representatives uh, of the um, trusts, including yourself. And then if we go to the third page, uh, where it says Section 4 Claims, 4A Claim Forms, 
NF handed out the new claims forms which he wanted DH sign off on. Um, could, why was it that the Department of Health sign off was being sought for claim forms for, for a, a new charitable foundation? Not sure what that's, what claim forms that would be. Um, Yeah, I'm not, I can't recall that. Okay. Um, uh, and then if we go to CAXT 40108 underscore 107, please. C A X T four zeros one zero eight underscore zero one seven. Not sure if I said that correctly. Sorry. Sorry, I'm just re reading four B, and it, it was so, mentioning about the claim forms. It seems it was in connection to skips and fund. Should we just go back to that? Because I don't want to. Sorry, I just caught the first line. No, that's all right. Changing slide. Um. Uh, if we just go back to the last document, please, show me the HPCT 40210 underscore 015 document. HPCT 40210 underscore 015. Third page. <laughs> so 4B accepting claims on the balance of probabilities. Um, GK, that's, I think, Graham Kent's Department of Health, had concerns over question 4A on the claim form where a doctor had to say when and where they believed an infection to have occurred. He was worried payments could be made below the balance of the probabilities. GK said that larger payments would be a greater incentive for speculative applications. So the claim forms were claim forms in relation to the enhanced stage two payments. It, it, was that your suggestion? Yeah, maybe it was the, so we had a separate form of for the top up. So it must have been in relation to a skip to fund top up for the twen uh, additional 25,000. Okay, thank you. Topping people up from 25 to 50. So but yeah, I, I thought it sounded odd. There wouldn't have been a specific claim for my design for anything to do with the Caxon Foundation. So I think this meeting was not just about the new charity, it was also about the 2011 changes to the Skipton Fund. Thank you, that, 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 that's useful. Um, so if we then go on to CAXT 40108 underscore 017, and we go, so we can see it's a meeting of the 4th of August 2011 of the Caxton Foundation. If we go to page 7, bottom of the page, so we can see there's a, a presentation by Professor Thomas. Um, and then um, at the very bottom, disbursement policies, preliminary considerations. The chairman invited Mr. Nicholas Fish to give a presentation on the likely number of Caxton beneficiaries based on past, current, and past historical date. Um, and then it says this, following a number of questions... It, it, that, that must be data. Yeah, I think it must be data, yeah, yes. <laughs> Following a number of questions that were concerned with garnering publicity for the foundation and how parity of the payment of disbursements with the HIV charities might be achieved. The chairman thanked Mr Fish for his exposition. Uh, can, can you recall anything about the discussions um, referred to there? So the, first of all, the question of garnering publicity for the Caxton Foundation. So I remember it was a, primarily a presentation on numbers. Um, I actually remember that. Maybe I raised the issue that because the McFarland Trusts have been running for so many years, um, obviously setting up this new trust with discretionary payments from 2011, there would have been a number of years where the people didn't have access to these payments. Um, in terms of garnering publicity, 
as well as however the Department of Health advertised it. Um, obviously, we advertised it on our website and added it into our application forms and guidance notes. Um, and if we go um, to CAXT 40110 underscore 134, please show me. This is a um, Caxton Foundation report from 2014, October 2014, from the Chief Executive, so Ms Barlow. I just want to ask you about the first paragraph. Towards the end of August 2014, the Department of Health asked the Skipton Fund to attempt to make contact with everyone who'd received a Skipton Stage 1 payment, but with whom there'd been no subsequent contact. This involved making contact with approximately 2,000 people, a large proportion of whom had received their Stage 1 payments before the Caxton Foundation was established. DH provided funding for two temporary members of staff to work on the project, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, d d can you assist with this? Had there been requests to the Skipton Fund prior to August 2014 for the Skipton Fund to take proactive steps to contact um, uh, uh, it, it's um, the recipients of Skipton payments to alert them to the Caxton Foundation? No, so anything the Department of Health, Health asked us to do in that regard, we would have done so. If that was the first date that this was mentioned, then we wouldn't have, certainly wouldn't have refused to do that at a previous date. Can, can you recall um, whether um, concerns have been expressed prior to, to this? by the Skipton Fund about either data protection as a reason for not um, assisting with um, this exercise or, or inadequate staffing as a reason for, for, for not assisting prior to additional staff being made available? No, because um, that's similar with the stage two look back in 2011. Um, we had means of getting around that, so when we telephoned people, we had to ensure we were speaking to the correct person before mentioning the Skipton Fund. So obviously, if you Google the Skipton Fund, the first thing that comes up is hepatitis C. So it would have been no, no different to do that for stage one as we did for stage two. Um, could we then look at, this is the last document for now, I think, SKIP... 5031 underscore 051, please. Um, this is an exchange of emails. I think I can probably pick it up just by looking at the bottom half of the page. So it's an email to you. Um, saying we're very concerned that the regular payments made to those in Wales may be stopped and do not wish this to happen. I can therefore confirm that the Welsh Government will underwrite any payments made by the Skipton Funds to Welsh recipients until the revised agency agreement has been put in place and any consequential amendments made. We would therefore like to confirm that we would like the Skipton Fund to continue to make regular payments to recipients in Wales. And then there's a similar confirmation top of the page in relation to Northern Ireland and um, also a confirmation in relation to Scotland. C c can you recall what prompted um, the um, discussion about uh, um, payments in respect of the devolved administrations? Yes, yeah, so I think we were contacted by the Department of Health who said that we shouldn't be making the regular payments yet to people in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland because they hadn't signed up to the changes to this scheme by way of, I think, the revised agency agreement that you mentioned. Um, we'd already been paying them regular payments, so we we're in a situation where we might have had to have stopped the regular payments to people who now come to depend on them, which obviously is unacceptable. Um, so as a way around this, a workaround, until those documents were finalised, we had to get consent from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland that they would underwrite the payments. So we can take that down. And just three final questions um, from me, um, Mr Fish, before uh, um, we may then need to break to ask for core participants to suggest any further questions. Um, the first is this. Skipton beneficiary files, you, you observed earlier, I think by reference to the inquiries 
um, report of its investigation so far, that there may be files that the inquiry doesn't have. And you described, I think, three lever arch files of, of natural clearer um, applications. <coughs> um, other than um, those files, um, th the inquiry, you're right, certainly doesn't have all the applicant beneficiary files. Are you able to assist with um, um, uh, um, what may have happened to um, the missing applicant beneficiary files or, or, or why some of the files, indeed I think most of the files that we have are incomplete? Um, so yeah, like I say, the, there was a, a large number of natural clearers, so that's some three, over 300 I think, that were stored. So obviously if you hadn't had access to those, you'd be thinking there's a massive gap or lots of applications missing. Um, in terms of approvals, I had to go through every application myself to ascertain which country of infection and I, which scheme would be taken on the payments for the individual. So I think there were only one, possibly two approved applications that I couldn't find out of thousands. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to those. Um, any that I approved would have been filed. So I can only assume they were a couple of applications that were before my time. Um, and in terms of rejections, again, any rejections that I made, I would have taken a copy of the form, um, stapled all the supporting information to it and filed it away in a box file. Um, so certainly by the time I left the Skipsa Fund, I don't consider there were any missing applications. If there were, I wasn't involved. Um, you told us how one of your responsibilities um, uh, in relation to M McFarlane and Caxton um, was to uh, make uh, uh, notes of meetings or minutes of meetings. Were you ever asked to change the minutes of a meeting to a content that you felt did not accurately reflect the content of that meeting? No. So depending on which chairman they would make revisions to my minutes, um, generally it was the wording rather than the content. But I, I don't ever remember thinking, how has that been put in or... Why has that been changed? It was more to do with the wording. Um, finally, you, you attended meetings at the Department of Health um, in your capacity as min administrator for the Skipton Fund. You also attended, I think not all, but at least some meetings with the Department of Health in the early days of, of Caxton Foundation uh, and um, some meetings in relation to the McFarlane Trust. Did you gain any... A particular impression of the Department of Health's interest in or attitude towards the financial support schemes? And if so, what was it? Um, not particularly. It was all fairly standard meetings, really. Um, I know that with the charities, the trustees always felt that they were underfunded, so there would have been a a tone of them saying we require more money to do the work that we'd like to be able to do. But with the skips and funds, there was never any hint that they were trying to sort of cut the funding to us, or um, there was no, never any issue really with us putting our forecasts in and then receiving invoices on that basis. Um, so, yeah, I suppose the only thing was with the charities that they were always, always after increased funding which wasn't always forthcoming. Um, so those are the questions I have for Mr Fish, um, but we need obviously to give core participants and their legal representatives the opportunity to suggest any further lines of questioning. So can I invite you to take a break at this stage? Uh, yes, so we'll, we'll take a break until 25 to 4. Uh, 25 to 4 gives uh, Council an opportunity to, to field the questions which uh, other participants may have um, for you. So, back, back here, please, by 25 to 4. Thank you, sir. Thank you.